you know, there's, there's no, there's no coincidence, you know, there's no thing as coincidence. Everything falls where it should. It's whether we respond to it or not, you know, you can be out of your mind, you know, like, you know, all those times I was drunk, I was praying to God and God never answered me. No, he answered you. You couldn't hear. Correct. You, you, that, that's right. So, you ignored it. Jim Brewer. 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 see my shirt everybody a lot of times i wore this on stage i wore this shirt on stage the last two three years of touring um this this is johnny cash has been a huge part of the brewer family for a long time the music and everything about the guy um every every family event we did this for my father's for my father's 85th birthday i put together a band and we did all johnny cash songs because he was such a big johnny cash guy and it was such a journey to have johnny cash's music in my life as my father got older if you all would saw my documentary called more than me more than me, which was basically about caretaking and how we handle our parents as they get older. You know, we look at our parents of these rocks and icons, but what they won't teach you in school is your parents, just like all other humans, start to fade away. And they're not these rock and, and, and these icons. They start to break apart. They start to get older, lose their memory. They can't walk. They can't drive. And one of the uh, most pivotal moments of my life with my father when, and I, I think my dad gave up. There was a moment where I saw my dad just kind of give up and he wouldn't shower or anything. And so I'd say, come on. You know, my, my, my mom would like, he won't shower and he won't do this and he's not taking care of himself and he's sleeping all day. Well, that's, that means you're giving up. You're, you're leaving everything. He's not eating. So I'd go in there and I said, come on, dad, we're going to go shower. And I get him in there and I, and I make it like a barber shop and a really cool environment. And we would play, uh, Hank Williams songs, which he loved and Johnny Cash non-stop Johnny Cash songs. He loved Johnny Cash um, to the point where my, f I believe my very, my very first concert was Johnny Cash. And I remember it. I remember it like yesterday and I saw him twice at the, it was called the Westbury Music Fair in Westbury, New York. And it was a stage that it's in the round and we go in a circle and I remember to the piano player. I forgot. I, I don't remember the piano player. My the piano player would do. Johnny would introduce him and go, "Here's so and so. Here's so and so." And he and he play this piano song. And my mom loved the song. And I still try to go back and find it. And I found the song about two years ago. And because I was thinking of my mom, I was reflecting, thinking of my mom and Johnny Cash in that moment. But. And every, every outing, every barbecue, every family get together, we'd always, always play Johnny Cash. So today's kind of, uh, it, it, it's just interesting how the Johnny Cash world keeps spinning back into me. And then I did the documentary where I filmed me and my father on tour. And a lot of people think, I just started filming for that documentary. I, I, I had my dad, I, I had my dad on tour forever. I, I, from 2008 on, I was touring with him. Uh, but that last one, he, he, I, I take about even before that, long before that, I'd bring my dad on the road all the time. There's a million stories of my dad on the road. And, uh, the, the, the <laughs> We'd always blast Johnny Cash on the thing on the on the on the tour bus, and in that documentary, more than me, probably the most pivotal moment is 
when I was leaving my dad, he dropped the deuce in his pants. I was dry heaving my ass up. And it was a very awkward moment. Uh, I just wanted to get out and escape. And I was tired of caretaking. Uh, and I left. And when I, uh, and I was trying to leave and Johnny Cash was playing in the background. It was just such a emotional moment that I didn't even realize it was happening. So Everyone has some type of band, some type of music that's been very pivotal and moving in their life. So this was this was out in the, out of left field. I'm going to a Ira Dean. Ira Dean's getting married. He's a country singer, songwriter. And I gotta have Ira on. He told this whole story. Maybe, maybe um Thomas Gabriel will know, but we today we have Thomas Gabriel who's actually an incredible songwriter, musician, does country music. Well, I guess, yeah, it's like country music. He's got his own style. I really like the style of music he does. And he also did, you know, a tribute to his grandfather. This is Johnny Cash's grandfather. He's also got quite a deep, incredible story that I believe is very healing, uh, very truthful for a lot of you to listen to, where he went down a path. So... I'm super excited about today's guest, which is Thomas Gabriel. How you doing? What a small world, man. Yeah. No what? A, no, you know, so first of all, I know you know Ira Dean. Oh, yeah. Known him for years. So, I, well, I was just telling everyone, I, I, I don't want to make this not about Thomas Gabriel, but as you said, I'm a Johnny Kett. So my first concert was your grandfather right it was it was westbury music fair long island westbury new york um so and i was just i was just explaining to everyone your grandfather's been a a huge part of our family's life and culture and everything just everything about it and so with that i kind of out of nowhere ira dean kind of pops into my life right we had a hurricane, a hurricane down here and um you know, he's like, Jim, you know, will you host this thing? I don't know him from a hole in the wall. And then he starts telling me his story, how he lived with your grandfather. I'm like, what? Yeah. Okay. Then he's telling me that uh, John Jr. is marrying him. And he's like, best friend. I'm like, what? Yeah. And then, I, then I'm sitting there. And my best friend Larry calls he's like, bro, you gotta get, you gotta talk to Thomas Gabriel. The story, like, oh my god, bro, this is you. This is this is one of us. This guy's one of us. His story and the Steve. And I went, oh, okay. And as I'm as I'm, he's giving me the number. Iris sitting in front of me, we're having coffee. He's like, oh, I know Thomas. Here, I'll give you. I'll, I'll reach out to him now. Like, wow, like, what is what yeah, is going on right now? I was in the shower when he called me. I wish I would have answered then, but I uh, I called him later on, and you guys were off the – had already gotten off, but – yeah. So, well, the first thing I want to ask you is um, – eighth. well, first I want to thank you for coming on. Yeah. It, I want to hear about your journey too because you have a very serious, honest, hardcore journey, which which goes along with – many people but you know people just think like oh they'll hear the name whatever famous name it is and they just think everyone's living in this beautiful simple world and oh well surely life must be wonderful um so we'll get to yeah we'll get to that journey i what when did you start did you start the music as as a child because i feel like i i read somewhere that you i guess your grandfather and june carter would bring you on tour once in a while or you would see them perform once in a while that was the bug that started all yeah when when i was little um you know my mother my mother had me when she was 16 years old you know so yeah yeah, yeah. like like most families uh the grandparents stepped in a lot you know help help out because you know 16 years and so we were actually living in, I was born in California. Um, my grandpa lived here and he said, if you, if you move to Tennessee, if you bring Thomas and move to Tennessee, then I'll give you a job and help you reestablish out here. Cause my, 
plus getting away from my dad was an issue as well. So yeah, yeah. we, uh, so we came to Tennessee and she worked for him, uh, in his publishing company, uh, based, you know, she had to learn a lot. She was so young. And in the meantime, I was uh, too young for school at the time, but to, you know, uh, so I ended up started being kind of babysat on the road, like John Carter, you know, kind of with him, you know? Yep. Uh, yep. 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 So yep. He pretty well as brothers, you know? And so, uh, grew up a lot of time on the bus, a lot of time and, uh, you know, just moving around, moving around, stuff like that. So by the, by the time I kind of came into an understanding of, of the way the world worked or didn't work, um, was, uh, was just that. I mean, that was the only thing I really had had to uh, to base anything on, and I loved it. I loved. Uh, I just uh, the crowds, the 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 noise, the you know. I mean, um, the the music, the all of it. It, it just. I mean, my very first memory of life is Caesar's Palace, and and wow, the, that's my very first memory of life. And I remember just the excess. I lo- you know what I mean? Just this, yeah. And uh, so it, it really, it, yeah, it, it reeled me in. And uh, so I never really thought of, I never thought of, I would do anything else. And um, of course, you know, I can, we can go, we can go for days on this one, Jim, but. Um, Let's go. You know, <laughs> so fast forward a little bit. Um, you know, I was, I uh, got into, uh chemicals you know uh, drinking uh, whatever uh, by so so earth. before if you don't mind me stopping you so uh-huh. thomas you're you're how old are you i am you know, your mom's 16 right well i know oh. where i know how old you are now but like you're 16 i mean your mom's 16 which is yeah. which is hard and you know god bless her for making the move and yeah. doing what she has to do um is there a dad in the in the scenario at that time, are you growing up with a dad, or it's just your grandparents and and John is helping out? My uh, once we moved, my dad uh, pretty well severed ties. You know. Okay. Okay. So, which uh, is hard, which which is hard for any child to be dead yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> what age? What age are you? But when when things start like oh you know what? I'm gonna start drinking I'm gonna start what, what what age does that start? I remember very vague, vaguely like it was yesterday. I remember I was about second grade, and I remember I was out in the yard uh, at my mom's house, and it was a beautiful day outside. It was like one of those seventy and sunny breezy days, like the perfect day. Yeah, and I remember having this feeling, this terrible feeling, and they like anxiety, you know. And and if you're if you're a child and you and you have anxiety or anything like that, and you don't have a word for it, all you know is you feel bad. You know, you don't you feel bad, and so anxious that I went to a neighbor. There was a neighbor woman. um, Her her sons had already gone off to college, but she was always really nice. She was like the cookie. You know, like the person made cookies and then they rode that type of thing. And I remember I went and knocked on her door and I and I said, uh, she answered and I said, I don't feel good. I don't feel right. I, I'm I'm sad. You know, and it was like I didn't have the words for it. That's all I knew to say. Wow. And I remember she brought me in and she kept me busy. I remember we took like uh, you know silly putty and put it on newspapers, you know, stuff like that. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. But soon after, very soon after that, I uh, I came across alcohol, and I remember the first time, like the first time, se- second grade, third grade, you know. What? Grade. I remember. I remember that feeling. I went. I don't ever want to not feel this again. Wow. And I said, "Baby, to- you're a baby." Yeah. And I set out to do that. Um, and did a really damn good job of it until until almost four years ago. Why? That's how long your journey was with with uh, alcohol and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and forgive me for not knowing. So at this stage, is is 
I would assume your mom or 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 John, John Jr. or is Grandpa still alive at this at, at part oh, yeah. of this? When does Grandpa die? All right, when my grandpa, grandpa. What's that? I'm sorry. I was 30 when my grandpa died. Oh wow! So because I'm under the assumption too. He was a very, uh, uh, he was a Jesus guy. He was a big, uh, which I learned as time went on. He was, he was more God, Jesus. And was everyone around you trying to intervene and trying to help? Or was this like, what was going on at that time? Not really. Um, You got to figure it was eighties too, right? You know? Okay. Okay. Uh, So let's picture late seventies, early eighties. And then coming into eighties, you know, like, uh, when Coke got so huge and all this kind of thing, yeah. you know, everything was excess. And when you're on the road all the time and you're around all these major artists and their people and you're on a bus and you kind of get forgotten about because the production production is huge. You're right. Not, you know what I mean? Right. Right. So I found myself like there's, <laughs> There's several times uh, I'll be talking to John Carter about something and he'll be telling me a story and I go, yeah, I was there. I know. I know. What do you mean? Why are you telling me this? And, uh, and I got to realize in the more and more and more that as I got older and, and in my addiction, my addiction started to take over who I was. Mm-hmm. So that I, I learned to kind of stay in the shadows and, and, and just be quiet and, if I wasn't seen, then I could get away with pretty much anything. And wow. I, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. For a long time. Mm. You know, I remember being just black. I absolutely couldn't hardly stand up as a little kid and nobody noticing just because they're not looking for that. And I'm not saying anything, you know. Wow. So now that then kind of, I would assume then w- the drugs come. Whatever mm-hmm. drugs, what was, it, what was the drug of choice? Um, I, every drug came uh, and went, but I always hated. I, I wasn't, I wasn't big on weed because it made me laugh, and I didn't want. I didn't, it made me feel stupid. You know what I mean? I, I didn't want to be. You know, I, I, I wasn't here to have a good time. You know, <laughs> that wasn't the thing I was here to do. I was here to numb. So my drug of choice, honestly, uh, alcohol, uh, benzodiazepines, cocaine, methamphetamine, um, you name it. I, I wasn't really big into opiates much, um, so I kind of went against family tradition there. But uh, anything that, that just made me numb. Mm. Wow, dude, that's so tragic. That is such a tragic... I'm not sure I've heard of anyone starting at such a young age. By sixth doing- grade, I, by sixth grade, I was taking, I was taking vodka to class because I had, to. I had. Wow. To. I remember being, I think, fifth grade, and I heard some kid was smoking weed. And I'm like, why? Doing drugs. And I remember telling my mom, hey, "Ma, this kid was, what is?" I said. Mom, what does weed mean? She's like, what do you mean by that? I said, we, one of the kids said they were smoking weed. She went, who said they were smoking weed? Like, what are you talking? Are you sure you heard this? I'm like, yeah, no. Greg Angrisani said, was talking about smoking weed with Zizzo. And like, oh, so, but that to me was like, so, and here you are just crushing it with vodka. Um, See, the, the thing about it is, unlike most, <laughs> unlike most addicts, I didn't like to share. Okay. Um, I, I didn't like to, I, my, my stash was my stash. I didn't like to share. I also didn't like people knowing. So I would, mm. I, I had no idea. They just knew I, sometimes I smelled like it or sometimes I acted a little different than I did the day before. But my biggest thing was maintain, trying to maintain. Like I, I did, I rode motocross bikes, you know, I, uh, with, but I would drink half rum, half water all day long. I, uh, you know, I would take my brakes off, stuff like that. You know, um, when I, you know, driving and everything, like I, I drove drunk for you. I've never had a DUI. I've never had a drug charge. I took my, put it to you this, I took my, uh, re, uh, the reservoir that you put your windshield wipe, wiper fluid. Okay. Yeah. My, yeah. I have beer. They had two of them. 
I emptied out the one for the rear and rerouted it, rerouted it to inside my vehicle so I could have vodka inside the vehicle without, and if I got stopped, it wouldn't be found. That type thing, like functional alcoholic to the to, to the point of of just that it was my new god. You know what I mean? That god. Wow. And, and, wow. So, you know, so to perfect that, you've got to have this balance. You do meth, cocaine, whatever, to wake up. And you drink, so you stay here. You don't want to do this. Ever. Good God almighty. For 24 um, hours. You and can f- steroids and, and all that kind of thing, too, because you got to look at shape as well. Uh, right. You know? <laughs> right, right. So how old do you, and, this, and then this eventually leads into uh, getting in trouble with the law. Well, and- I was a cop first. You were what? I was. I was a police officer for eight years. You, and you back, back up a second on that one there. If that, to, to explain that one right. So you were talking about earlier my grandpa getting and, and me getting into music and all that. Right? Yeah. 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 He had given me kind of a, a pass. You know, I, I played him some songs. And uh, of course, I was in kind of like a metal band then. And uh, I was, was, I wrote all the songs. Okay. Played, and uh, I took, I went to him and said, Hey, I, I got some really good stuff. I'd like to put it on tape, you know, that eight at cassette. And um, he said, Okay. He said, You can use my studio. He said, I just want to hear everything that comes out of it. No problem. So I went in and did an EP and uh, it came out, actually, it came out really well. It came out really good. I was really proud of it. And I, so I took him the finished product, the cassette, and uh, gave it to him. And I said, hey, here's, here's, here's the music. Now I'm expecting him to take it and come back and be like, you know, screech in the driveway and be like, this is the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> right. You are the new Metallica. I didn't know. I, I don't understand this metal music, but I just discovered Anthrax, but- Judas Priest, Maiden. Now there's Thomas Gabriel. Yeah, yeah, man. I know the. F- yeah, okay. So you're jacked up. You're already in the arenas, live yeah. in concert with special guest Iron Maiden, Thomas Gabriel. Ah, okay, dude. Do you still have these too? By the way. Somewhere, yeah, somewhere. Oh, else. dude, you got to find these. I would, yeah. you know, I'm a metal guy. I'm a big metal guy. I grew up. I am, that's all I listen to. Bro, I'm flying to Germany to go see Judas Priest for one night. That's how crazy I am. Priest, uh, I think next week or so. I, I don't know. I raced over here listening to Prong. So, uh, wow, you're you're full. Okay, all right. This is this is all right. All right. So now you make this metal. <laughs> You make your music. You think it. You're thinking grandpa's okay. <laughs> Melodic. We're not talking about like death metal or anything like that. You know, at the time it was like, um, you know, I don't know. It, maybe it had some uh, nuance. It's eighties. You grew up in the eighties, like me. Right. So yeah. Whatever. I give him this cassette. He leaves, and he said he'd be gone for the rest of the day. So. The next day he pulls in. I see him pull in. I'm like, all right, man, here we go. He's gonna come in. You know, the clouds <laughs> and uh I walk, hey, what do you think? He's like, About well, what? <laughs> the tape I gave you. He goes, Oh, oh, he said, Yeah, we need to talk about that. Oh wow. Now, it was though. All right, he's kind of like me. You give me a gift that I love. And I, and I look like you just gave me something I can't stand. I mean, I, I just don't have that. I, I can try it, but he had that too. Like, it was just always just kind of a... Right. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, I'd take it until, until he let you know which way he was going. But, so he said, uh, meet me at the top, front porch, and we'll talk about it. I said, all right. So now I'm nervous and everything. I, so I'm sitting on the front porch, and he comes up, sits down, and... Uh, he said, I listened to it. It's good. It's real good. I said, Thank you. He said, you, uh, you're writing. And he starts, so you, he starts. And so I know he listened to everything. Cause he started breaking it down. What he thought about everything. Okay. And, uh, he said, you're writing. He said, um, you need more life experience, you know? 
Mm. And I, okay, who's going to tell me at, at 28 years old? <laughs> right, right. This Especially, guy. The hell do you think you are, Mr. Cash? You know? Yeah, yeah. Johnny Case. <laughs> Whatever, Grandpa. What do you know? Okay. And, uh, so I took that with stride, you know, I, I'll, I'll consider it. And, uh, and he, he said, your vocals, he said, are pretty good. He said, and he said, they honestly remind me of the kind of me when I was younger. He said, but you need to work on them. Hmm. And I said, okay, take that too. And, uh, and you know, he kind of gave me, but he was thorough. He, and, and he was, and he was non-biased and I was grateful for that. Now here's how he closes it off though. Out of nowhere. He's talking about my music. He just listened to, and he goes, "I want you to go be a cop." What? Like, did I just hear that right? Did I? I mean, say that again. You know, he said, "I think you should be a cop. I think you'd be good at it." First of all, I had just gotten out of jail like the weekend before for at a Pantera concert. I got in a fight, broke the door. <laughs> okay, I had a mohawk and was like. You want me to be a cop? Okay. I was like, so I'm listening. This is interesting, you know. And uh, he said, and I brought somebody to talk to you about it. And one of the guys that works for him that did security was off-duty police officer. And he had called him over. And he's walking over to me. And I'm, it's surreal. I'm like, what the hell? What, what, how did we get from this to this? What had happened was <clears throat> my grandmother, Vivian, got wind because uh, I sent her a copy of this music. Okay. She was allowing me to do this. And that scared her to death because not only did I already have substance abuse problems, but she saw what it did to her family. Right. And drugs and all that. Later on, come to find out that they had spoke and, uh, he, he kind of made, he kind of made it out to me. Like you need a backup plan in case he said, the music industry is really tough and, and, uh, you know, so you, you got to have, he said, you're not really interested in college because I, they had asked me to leave. I went to college for a couple semesters, I think, until the dean called me in and asked me to leave. So that was kind of out of the question there. So next thing I know, I'm in the academy. And next thing I know, I'm on the street. And I was, uh, I was an officer for uh, eight years in Nashville here. And, and are you still... So you came out of jail. How long were you in jail? I just spent an overnight that night. I mean, it was okay. like a disorderly like drunk thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. The fight and Pantera. Okay. So during Got that it. time, during that time, you st- I would imagine th- the booze and all that is still continuing. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So went to the Academy, did all that. Now I will say, um, my drinking got less and less because I was, I got into it. I got to admit, I got into the whole cop thing. I didn't. Mm. And it's, and, and it's a life. It's it, that, that is a lifestyle. That is not just a, you don't just go there and come home. And, you know, I was always into guns anyways and things like that. I was always into, you know, it, it worked oddly. Yeah. You gotta be, you gotta be a certain amount of criminal to be a, a, a good cop anyway, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I did that, but went through a divorce and my pill, uh, I was taking amphetamines to sleep for literally like an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, I worked midnight shifts. I worked all night. I would stay up all day. I would drink all day long. And then I would take an Ambien and two or three Adderalls at the same time because Ambien kicks in in like 10 minutes. Adderall takes about an hour, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. So give me about 45 minutes to sleep. So then I would wake up, pumped up, ready to go, but I'm still, dead, you know? Yeah. Go get in a patrol car and patrol. When you, when you were an officer, was there, um, was there one moment that still stands out where you're like, that moment? Was it, do you ever have um, someone draw a gun on you or anything like that? Because that happens very well, rarely. Most of the things, you know, I'm not bothered by much. That's another kind of a gift, I think. Um, 
of sorts. You know, there's not a whole lot sticks with me. Yeah. Uh, things with kids yep. stick with me. Yeah. Suicide. Reason. There was a summer where I went on so many suicides that literally uh, I had been on more suicides on my, of my own than any other officer together. Mm. And those, those to me always was, it was, it was something that, uh, you know, you just replayed and replayed and replayed. And then, you know, where, what would they think in or could I've done anything different? Uh, I had a, I did have one that, that I think about quite a bit. I'd gone on a, uh, and, and it's changed a lot in, for me in a lot of good ways too. Um, I'd gone on a call to a, uh, pro, uh, teenagers, like problem, uh, what's it called? Like, a, a youth, um, like a youth that, group or something like, a uh, uh, they, they can't do anything else with you. They send you there. Juvenile. Like, Did you like a juvenile or halfway home? One of those, one of those type of things. I, I think I know what you're talking about. Cause my, I, I have nephews that are, yeah. Right. So I went on a call to one of those. And this, this girl was uh, having a hard time, I probably having an anxiety attack, or whatever, you know. And, of course, I was, a, I was still a young officer, you know. I was only, I was probably 23 years old. Like yeah. Okay. So you're, you're still not wise, man. You're not, you know, no. you, know how to, you know how to do the job, but you're, you don't have much wisdom. Right. And I had gone to the call, and she was really upset. And, she, and this girl had a terrible life. She had a terrible life. And I talked to her for a little while, but I gave her the little bit of wisdom that I had. And, um, uh, and I, later on that night, about a mile from that, that, that call, you know, we left, I signed off and she was okay. I'd gone to, it was in the middle of the night. I pulled into a park and I like fell asleep. and you turn your radio up because your call number, once they can call any other number, but they call your call number. It's like saying your name, you, you hear it. Yep. So, and I just kind of dozed off and I woke up. They called me after about an hour. If they don't hear from you, they'll, they'll check all the cars that they haven't heard from. And after about an hour, so they called my number and I reached for the mic. And in front of me is a jungle gym. And there was caution tape that had been wrapped around the top of this jungle gym. And there was this girl hanging. Oh, front of my car and it was that girl that i went and talked to oh and that uh that was something that stuck with, you know still stays with me quite a bit you know like i'm like you know i went and talked to her and everything but there was no way that she could have known where i've gone i mean it's not like i said i'm gonna go to the park and sleep there was nothing like that you know what i mean it was like we found ourselves at the same place and and that's where things you know, and that that's the kind of things that, that stick with me. It's not the it's not the shootings and it's not the I've seen things in prison, you know, being a cop. And, and I did two. I went to prison twice, you know, between those two. I've seen some terrible, terrible things. Yeah. But it's stuff like that that, that sticks. With me. You know, just on a, a side note, I have uh, brothers that are cops. My nephews are cops. And, you know, there was a there was a period of time where you know, our country will, and even when you watch cops and you watch all these programs, they never get into those, th that what, what people have no clue what real officers go through. They, they, they don't, they don't, you know, and, and I, I, I got so angry during the stage of the whole anti-police thing. I'm like, you know what? You, you guys only see the one video and it's well-produced and it's well-manufactured and it's, it's an agenda. You don't know that it's the cop that shows up with the abused child. You don't know that it's the cop that shows up the first one on the scene to see the dead children and the dead family in the car from the accident. It's uh, you, you people have no clue. Um, and, and, and I would always get, and I always tell people, you know, if you, if you're the one that says, well, that's what they signed up for. Well, you're a fool. You're, 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 you, I can't even take you seriously. You're, oh, that's what they signed up. For. You're, that may be one of the most incoherent, uh, re 
ridiculous, thoughtless statements I've ever heard anyone ever say. It's so judgmental. It's disgusting. You have zero clue what an officer goes through in their lifetime. And so many of them have drinking problems. You know, my, my the oldest one was so funny. Gary was the funniest human. Gary Brewer was the funniest human being in the world. But, you know, like yourself, he came from a broken home. We had the same dads, came from a broken home. Everyone, I would get pulled over in Long Island, New York, and they're like, you're Gary's brother? Oh, my God. Dude. Yeah, brother's the fun, but he, you know, he loved drinking and, and, and then I realized as I got older, the things that they saw, and then the other brother's just silent. He's just, yeah. he's just, he doesn't speak about any of it. My father was in the war. He don't speak any of it. He would just, you know, it, it's, it just, um, People need to know that side of an officer. And when they when they see an officer, you don't know what that man has gone through in his lifetime. He's not just a guy with a badge pulling you over for a ticket. So sorry, that's my little rant. Oh. I had to put that rant out there, Thomas. Look, I've been to prison twice and every one of the guards is always like, Man, you're you're the most respectable. I'm like, if you only knew. Like I never said <laughs> Right. But, you know, but police, I mean, I'm I'm a I'm police supporter I've, I've gotten so much flack from wearing the the blue lives matter thing on on one of my uh one of the videos i did i don't know two years ago now but got more slack about that than anything um i don't care That's i don't care either. What, yeah i'm not uh, um <laughs> i'm not here to make you happy you know i'm right um uh, here to stand up for, for what i believe in and and uh, and have a cause and have have a, have a reason and have have the the right to be able to do that. Yeah. Police, you know, like any other, we all start out at when we're little, Jim. You know, we start out thinking the world is one thing. I know. It'd be this part of it. We're going to be this thing. We're going to be this part of this world that we think we're in. And the world isn't what you thought it was. Nope. And you can't. And you can't be that part. No. So you've got to be, you've got to be a different part. You've got to ad adapt, and you've got to you've got to step up, you know. And and when you figure that out, sometimes sometimes that psychologically with people that 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 tends to either <clears throat> put them in a place of all right, and you can tell, and these people like really start to take off. They start to find themselves. They start to uh, really connect with with their purpose, or they don't, and then. And you see them <clears throat> kind of on the, do the decline, you know, or or check out, or become anti this or anti that, or it's uh, because they don't know where they fit. Right. You know? They they get caught up in whatever circus is coming through the town, or they think is the most appealing or the right cause to jump into, and there they go off to the races. Um, yeah. Did you find your purpose? Have you found your purpose, Thomas? I have. I have. I, uh, about, uh, so nearly four years ago, um, of course I'd already been touring and I'd done a lot of shows and, you know, thought, yeah, music, that's a, I'm back in my music. So that's all I needed, you know? Yeah. Of course I was drinking a half a gallon of, uh, Evan Williams, hundred proof a day <sighs> through, uh, you know, two grams of, of meth a day. Still I'm all not the way up to four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And and before uh, we even go that, before we, I want to know about your purpose. Yeah. Are you are you sober now? You're struggling. You're a hundred percent sober. How did that happen? How did that happen? It doesn't even cross my mind. For the first time in my life, it never crosses my mind. How that happen? Well, that's kind of what I was going to start with. With what I was saying a minute. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Um, I was miserable, and I just I knew it. But I was having a lot of fun. I was with a lot of people that were preoccupying that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you know, you state to state, different girls, different, you know, whatever, anything to preoccupy you. Yep. It's where you have to think. And uh, everybody's telling you how great you are and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's easy to get. I got. But tell me, I'm I'm great. Um, you know, I'm, while I'm down in a bottle of Jägermeister in the back of the van, just to just to be able to not not shake, so I can talk to people. 
And uh, so, you know, I'm miserable. I'm fat. I look, I look terrible. I'm bloated, you know. Anyways, I met this girl. And one night, and it, you, you ever, you know, when you meet somebody that's like, that you really connect with and you see them for the first time and, and you, you know, you've seen them before, but you know, you haven't. Yes. You know? Okay. And uh, something about this girl, man, just really stuck out. And I didn't, I was, and I was shy. I'm not a shy person. There's nothing shy about me. And I was shy. Like I was stuttering and things like that, you know, so like, yeah, something's up here. So I tried to get in touch with her a few times, ask her out. She turned me down you know, and all that. And come to find out that she had kind of heard about my reputation a bit and uh, was leery, you know, as anybody should be. <laughs> what a shocker. I mean, come on. I want to go out. The guy's yeah. been in jail and prison. The guy's been drinking since he's eight years old. That sounds fun. He's doing meth and stuff, do some lines. Let's hang out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy her. Yeah. The guy that doesn't blink for five days. Right. <laughs> right. You know, but um, so one night I conned her basically into going out with me. I told her I had an event. And I had to have a date. You know, it's one of those things. Sure. I've I've never been to anything like that where I have to have a date. You know, it's kind of like uh, going to a restaurant and them saying you have to wear a jacket or something. Like that. It was a total fabric. But she fell for it, I guess. And uh, I was late picking her up because I'm an hour late pretty much everything I do. And we went to this thing. We had a really great night. And I had a bottle behind my seat. And when she wouldn't be looking or whatever, I was having to down this bottles to get my shakes down and stuff, you know. I was trying to hide that, you know, uh, being having to be dependent on something to, to function. Right. Anyway, one day um, we'd, we'd seen each other for a couple times and everything. And I thought, man, I'm just not good enough. I'm not good enough for this. I'm not good enough. But I, I want to be. And then I got to thinking. And, I, and so I'd, I'd gone. It was a New Year's Eve show in Texas. And I went. And everybody there was doing what I did and I would normally be doing it. And for some reason, man, I just wasn't in it. I wasn't in it at all. And I kept just thinking about this girl and wishing I was somewhere else and kept thinking about my life and all this kind of stuff. And it just dawned on me. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm miserable. I, I, I hate myself. I couldn't look myself in the mirror anymore. Um, which is another reason I grew the beard just so I didn't have to look at, so I look at something different. Wow. I saw on the beard when I, when I got sober. But anyway, back to the point, and I'll do that a lot, uh, jump around. But uh, That's right, I do the same thing. I uh, I went to her and I said, I need to talk to you. I said, look, I got a lot of problems. I said, I'm a really screwed up person. And uh, I got a lot of PTSD. I've got a lot of substance abuse, uh, substance uh, uh, addiction. I'm an asshole, you know all these things, you know, and, and uh, I want to be better. And if you'll give me a chance, I will do every, anything I can to be better. And she said, okay. And so about two or three days later, COVID hit. Mm. And COVID hit, like, remember that? It was just like the day that COVID. March. You know, March 2020 or March something. Yeah, yeah, March. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> that day that COVID stopped the clock, um, I was trying to get into a rehab. My twenty, it would have been my twenty fourth rehab, and nobody would take me. So I said, "Well, I'm doing this." So I had a fifth wheel <clears throat> trailer, and uh, I got a big four by four dually. So I backed the trailer up, and I said, "We're going to go out in the middle of nowhere. And we're going to do this. Mm. If you'll do it with, me, you'll help me. We're going to do this." So, man, I, we stocked up on Evan Williams, took all the drugs I could possibly hide in that thing but without, t- without telling her. Otherwise, she wouldn't have gotten in <laughs> so I, everywhere. Got Coke at different places. You know, I've got pills, everything, anything you can think of stashed all over the place. I'm like, all right, well, when this is gone, it's gone. Right. So we went out there and she literally for six weeks straight <clears throat> every day measured out my alcohol every throughout the day 
we started out with a whole lot. Like I was blasted at first, but we got down to a, a thimble eventually after six weeks. She, uh, and she said, you're going to, you're going to do every drug you got. She's like, but you're going to do it in front of me. And I don't know about you, but I can do it all day long in a bathroom. Hiding. I, Hiding. I, yeah. But it, when you're out in front of somebody that you you respect, mm. somebody that you like that, man, it, it really takes on a whole new, you know, it's, it, it's, it's embarrassing for one. It's humiliating. Right. He did that. So I would sit there with a glass pipe and a razor blade and a mirror line and I'd smoke some and do a line, smoke some. It took me about an hour to get enough in me to where I could function. And, uh, she watched me do this in horror, literally. And, uh, when it was gone, it was gone. And I haven't touched it since. And I haven't missed it. I haven't, I haven't thought about it. I don't pass liquor stores anymore and think about alcohol. I don't, I don't, I can go by every beer section and never even notice. And that's never been the case, man. It's always preoccupied me. The longest I have ever gone after rehab is three months. So, so is there a, because you know, a lot of times there's a, um, uh, an aha moment or a God moment. Was there a God yeah. moment? That's what, yeah. So you asked about purpose. So the road got different. The road got totally different. We had to change all the rules, how we do after shows, during shows, all that type of thing. And I started uh, Monday motivations on Facebook. I do Monday motivations. Most Mondays uh, I've, I've skipped a few um, for surgeries and stuff like that. I had to have open heart surgery not too long ago. Um, but I do Monday motivations and basically like we were talking about earlier, you know, getting out. One of the things that keeps me, me, keeps me on track between the ditches basically is, is, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be honest with yourself Yeah. and you gotta be that's all you gotta be. Those two things and everything else will come into play. I've never been either one of those until four years ago. Mm. So Monday motivation is me basically sitting down, you know, doing, the, I was going to say writing, but it's doing this and sending it out there to the world. Basically, you know, and I used to send them out and be like really nervous. What people are going to say right. now, back to what I feel, what I'm feeling at the time. And I send it out and I don't even, I don't even go back again for another couple of days to see how people respond. To it. But it got to be where we, I'd be on the road and people would come up to me about my money motivation. Mm, right. And that's, they would they stop mentioning my grandpa so much. They stop right. things you sing so much like him. They stop mentioning that type of thing. Mm. And people and saying, You gave me so much hope. Yeah. Or my son's in prison and you've really helped me understand a lot about, you know. And all of a sudden, man, my heart just flung open. Literally like like barn doors flung open. Like this is what this is what I need right here. Yep. This is Need because the opposite, you know, addiction literally the opposite is connection. Right. You know, right. That's your God. Yes. That's your everything. That's right. You know. That's right. So now this hope, this open door connection I've got with people everywhere I go, and you'd be shocked at some of the places I'll be, and somebody come up and say, "Hey, I heard what you, you know, I liked what you said about whatever." Or my son went through this. You know, I was in Ireland, man. Had and I thought. You know, that's going to be really hard for me to go because I'd been going to Ireland and like all the pubs knew me in like a certain area. Right. You know, and I, hard to do. I didn't have any problem at all. And those guys were coming to my shows telling me, you know, how proud of me they were. You know, that's, you know, I think that, uh, that everything that I have gone through, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for prison. I'm grateful for all the fights. I'm grateful for all my broken fingers still. I'm grateful for all the the heartbreak, all that kind of stuff. Because without it, man, I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I could I could fit that part. And that's what I mean. The world wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Mm. That part that I, oh, you know, you know, Thomas. That's uh, um, it, I I still even not not today. I I started going into transformation too 
with the identity thing. And you actually just inspired me to do something. So it is such a, um, you found an identity and there's, it's, it's incredible. I've, when I, when I'll do shows, I love hearing them funny and all that, but the, it was during COVID that I really started putting for me, I always felt the purpose to put more of a, uh, spirituality God thing at the front and center. I don't know the Bible well, and I don't know, I don't know all that well. My wife's more into that. I'm not, but I do know, uh, you know, I, and I was so afraid to put that out there. So afraid. But I started getting really tired of the identity of like, you're the funniest thing. You're the funny. Like I, I'm blessed for it. It's yeah. God gave me that gift. But it's when people started saying, hey, man, uh, those videos changed my life. Those videos you put out, th those words you were saying may, got me through that time. They got me through my addiction. They got me through my father passed. They got me through and I'm, and I'm hearing it more. And the more and more I, I, I go in that direction, which I feel really good. I was so afraid I'm going to lose so many people, but I'm like, why am I afraid? If it feels so good, there's nothing better in the world when you realize that really to heal humanity is the most powerful thing in the world. And to know that a uh, Thomas Gabriel, to go through the incredible journey that you're talking about from a child with no father, your mom was young, you're in the limelight, you're kind of lost in the shuffle, you don't re you're looking for that, do you try to become this and you try to become that? And all through that, to go through that and survive it all, to survive it all. I mean, to prison. I know family members been there. It's it's it is you just never know where life is bringing you and why it's bringing you but it's incredible when you finally find your path and how beautiful it can be and i, I i'm super excited to hear you say this you know there's there's no there's no coincidence you know there's no thing as coincidence everything falls where it should it's whether we respond to it or not you know so many times opportunity has come my way and I haven't noticed it because I wasn't capable. Right. Right. You know, you can, you can be, you can be out of your mind, you know, like, you know, all those times I was drunk, I was praying to God and God never answered me. No, he answered you. You couldn't hear. Correct. You, you, that That's right. So, you ignored it. You ignored it. Right. You ignored it. So, like you just said, and that's wonderful because I've, I've kept up with you. I've, I've since, since Saturday night live, I've kept up with you. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think, and I have noticed that, 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 you know, I think, and I have noticed that, 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 let me get that off there. Um, I think that's something that's, I know that's something to be very proud of to take your platform and to say, you know, this is something I believe in something that is going to, for myself, this is something, you know, we're all here. We're here for a mission yep. and then to make it, you know, and if we don't fulfill that, then basically the way I believe it is, we kind of have to keep doing it until we do it right. Maybe a groundhog day type day, something. I don't know. I, no, I 100% agree. Go ahead. But so, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to hear you say that, but you're right, man. There's, there is no better feeling than that, than knowing that you've like, like prison and all that, it would have all been in vain if I didn't help at least one person. You know, a mother, uh, a, a, a wife, a, a, a prisoner that's just absolutely given up. You know, anybody, you help somebody, the more people you help, man, the more that feeds your soul like no other. You can't be, can't be anything. There's no. You know what I've learned too, Thomas, is that, and my wife was a huge help with this. She would always say, um, Hey, you don't know whose life you're touching tonight, but do know you have the capability of whatever your set's going to be, whatever you're going to say, 
there's one human being and she would go, Jim, you don't need to know who that human being is and you don't need to know or get the grace of like, oh, wow, I need that. I need that. You don't need it. Just know that person did it as you're saying it. And boy, that that was a major game changer for me. I could start crying thinking about it. And it's true. Yeah. I've had so, so, true. so many. One, one of the greatest. Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, it is out of all the money. Out of all the celebrities I met, out of all the, the great things we get to do, the st standing ovation, blah, blah, blah. I I, I can't even, rem I, I, not that they're meaningless, but it's when someone emotionally approaches me. I just had it in, a, in a Corpus Christi, Texas. The guy came to me and he went, bro, you don't understand. I, I listened to you on this interview and I, I called my dad and I started crying. I was like, Oh my God. And I, his wife was like, all right. I went, no, no, no. Let him talk. Let him talk. That I'll remember the rest of my life. I'll remember yeah. that the rest of my life. I'm not going to remember the sold out crowds. I'm not going to remember all that. And I don't think people realize. Great for it. You're great. Yes. Yes. You know. But I don't think people realize that this day and age, that is going to be more powerful. That's going to bring more unity and that's going to bring more healing when there's warriors uh, taking that yeah. on, man. I, I praise you, Thomas. I, I'm really glad you came on to share this incredible story. I, and I, I went on your site, man. You're not touring. When are you touring? I, I, just, had, <laughs> I just had heart surgery. Oh, jeez. Um, uh, that's right. You just had it recently. How, how are you even functioning yeah. right now? How, 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 how is that going along? What, you, can't do, you can't do kickboxing for a while? What do you got to do? Jim, the day before, I had, a, I had a heart attack like all day long the next day. Um, you know, I was like squatting like three feet, like a couple hours before my heart attack. You know, it's like, but yeah, it's really, heart attacks are weird, man. Uh, I don't, you know, take care of yourself. Definitely, definitely watch your diet. Um, but yeah, um, now that I'm healed up, I'm healed up. I'm almost released from doing my, my cardio rehab stuff. Mm. Um, I've still. I've had to have a couple of uh, lung procedures as well um, because heart's enlarged and it likes to back up into my lungs. Mm. But um, over that, and uh, we got a tour starting, of course, overseas, like uh, Scandinavia and all starting next month. But um, soon after, we'll be setting up as many domestic as, as possible. Well, more important is your, is your, is your life uh, where you're at in life. That's way more important than any tour in the world and any song in the world. Uh, I look forward to seeing you out there wherever, but I got to say this was super inspiring for me. It's really, um, there's a lot of things I have in my head I want to do and you just kind of inspired one of them. So I want to thank you for such an incredible, beautiful story, man. And thanks for coming on here to share it with you. And I, I wish you all the Thanks, best, man. man. Many blessings to you. And anything I can do for you, as far as that's concerned, as far as that is concerned, please let me know. You got it, brother. Thomas Gabriel, safe all journey. Right. The great inspirational Thomas Gabriel. More than just a, a, a musician. More than just a name. Uh, whew, what a... You know, he started talking about the inspirational stuff on Mondays where he just, and I, I know I keep, I, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm just being dead honest. Yes, I, I love being a comedian. I love it. I'll never stop trying to make people laugh. Um, but I've always had this deep, deep desire and calling I'll say more of a calling to inspire the world spiritually. And I just, I, I, you know, I'm like, I, you know, do I tour? Do I write a book? Like, you know, cause in the, in the world that I grew up in, it's, it's gotta be a performance. It's gotta be, you need a book and a tour and a this and a that where I had a friend, uh, my friend Joe who studied theology said, um, 
He's like, well, if you're thinking along uh, uh, in the lines of Jesus, he didn't have churches and he just, he just spoke. He just spoke. He just went and spoke. And it's just, it's interesting. I have to just start speaking and tell these stories. They're incredible stories. And whether people want to hear them or not, the ones that want to hear them will hear them. The ones that need to hear them will hear it. And um, hopefully I'll have the courage and the, and, and the bravery to just put it out there because I know a lot of people need to hear it. With that said, I hope wherever you are, you heard today's journey and how powerful that was and how it continues. And of all the things that that man's been through, it's the inspiration of his motivation of inspiring people. And I, inspiration is not taught in schools. Inspiration is not taught in your universities. Inspiration is not on your Sunday football. I mean, yeah, you know, to win the game and all that. But to inspire another human being to live life in a better manner. is a beautiful thing to do and don't ever underestimate it. Thanks for hanging out in the Bruniverse. We'll see you next week. Jim Brewer, and I got my own Patreon page, and hopefully you'll check it out. Live comedy concert streamed once a month. Early access to the Bruniverse podcast every single week, and have bonus footage and bonus segments. I promise you I'm not going to let you down. Go check out my official Jim Brewer Patreon page, and I'll see you there.